identity. And women, this is more important for you than for the men. Because nothing is worse than being married to a man who don't know who he is. The role of man's personal identity in the life of the country, of the community, and of the nation. I'm going to review some of the stats that are very important because I think the stats help us to understand why men are in trouble. And these statistics are very current, most of them. One of them is one year old. The rest of them are current. I always make the statement that the world is filled with males but very few men. And here are some stats to prove it. 93% of all criminal activity is perpetrated by males. 93%. That means the women are not involved in criminal behavior to the same degree as men. Number two, 92 percent of all prisoners in Western societies are males. That means only about 10 percent of the women are going to jail. 90 percent of the people in prison throughout the Caribbean and America are males. Number three, 89 percent of all acts of domestic violence in the Caribbean are perpetrated by males. That means when there is a problem in the home, it's usually instigated by the male. That means that we got problems in our family life with the male initiating it. And number four, 83% of all school dropouts are males. That means the women are staying in school and the men are leaving school. These are very serious statistics. Because if 20% of the women have no educational background, but 80% of the men don't, then most of the women are marrying men who cannot generate income because their level of education is not where it should be to generate the kind of revenue to take care of a family. Serious stats. Another one, 74%. Of all babies born outside of marriage are born to young women who are not married to men. Which means that if you go to our hospital today and there are ten babies in the room, seven of them don't have a father in the house. And most of the time, the mother is a teenager. Women don't get pregnant by themselves. Which means that the men are so promiscuous that they are perpetrating street children. Here's some other sad news about men. 90% of all gang members are males. 92%. That means only 10% of the women are joining gangs. The rest are males. Now we use the word gang, there are different types of gangs. But we're talking about those groups of social gatherings that, that are involved in antisocial behavior. How about this one? 78% of all drug dealers are males. 78% of all drug dealers are males. That means only 30% of those involved in drug dealing could be females. That means if we got a drug problem in the country, it's really being fed by men. Another sad statistic. The United States says $99.8 billion are spent every year on support enforcement programs because men will not take care of their children. The government has to spend $99.8 billion of tax dollars to take care of women whose men have left the home. The Bahamas... Entire budget is only about $2 billion. They spend $99 billion trying to find food for kids, for men who don't take care of them. Another sad statistic, 78% of all divorce cases are initiated by infidelity, especially of the male. That means that all the clogged up 
cases that are not being tried in our courts in the Caribbean, dealing with divorce, most of them are the result of the male infidelity. That means sweethearting. Which means that we are destroying the legal system because we can't get to the cases. We are destroying the home because the woman is hurt. We are being destroyed the children because the children lose the father who was divorced by his mother because he slept with another woman. And now we got kids who are angry at society and they're the ones that join gangs and they rob us. In other words, the male seems to be the key to all the problems. And you know, it's amazing. The average male will say, why are you bashing us? Why are you always negative against men? Look at the statistics. This is not bashing. This is acknowledging the state of things. You cannot fix a problem until you first identify it. 91% of all incest cases are perpetrated by males. 91%. That means it's rare for a woman to commit incest. 10% of the time. That means when you have incest with problems on Andrus and Long Island and Cher Island and, and Abaco and Atlas and Dan Bahama and in Nassau, the men are doing it. They're sitting with their daughters or their stepdaughter. And sometimes it's a stepson. They got issues. And there are men in this room who will tell you that they were molested by their own fathers. What are we going to do here? Some of my brothers in prison, I know you're watching this. You know, when you're in prison, you can't get sex. At least not with a woman. So the pressure is tough. And if you're born again and you're in prison, you've got to keep yourself. That means you've got to become what God calls a eunuch. It's tough. We as men must step up and raise the bar. What is the impact of these statistics? Let me give you the impact. Number one, broken homes. Number two, single mothers. That alone is a problem by itself. Number three, crime. Number four, homicides. Number five, gang warfare. Number six, drug abuse. Number seven, teenage pregnancy. Number eight, acts of rape. You don't hear too much in the news about a woman raping a man. Matter of fact, I ain't sure I ever heard that. I'm still trying to figure out if I ever heard it. I want to meet that brother. He must be a cool brother. You don't hear about women raping a man. I'm sure it exists now. But the brother didn't want to report it. It was a good rape, as far as he's concerned. Rape me again, man. <laughs> now, would we... <laughs> Some of y'all need to get saved all over again. Number nine, domestic abuse is a result of all those thefts. And a man perpetrates these hideous behaviors that affect our society. Now, what does this mean to the nation? Let me give you a list. I'll write this down. Very important. How does it affect the nation? Number one, higher taxes. If 90% of the men in prison have to be fed and clothed and sheltered 
provided water for, electricity for themselves. They got to handle these men. Got to feed them three times, four times a day. They got to give them work to do. They got to provide the equipment. That's a lot of money that the taxpayer has to pay. And then we got to build a prison, maintain it, clean it, and we got to also provide the security for it. We got to pay those officers. That's millions of dollars because somebody committed a crime. Criminal behavior is not a personal issue, brother. It's a national security issue. When you break the law, you affect every single citizen. Number two, less national development. If you've got to spend $99 billion on the absence of men in the home, how can you build schools? How can you build bridges that you need? How can you build uh, houses to help the poor? Because you've got to spend the tax dollars on crime and protection. You know, uh, these beautiful people we have with us today, the great young men who signed today from prison. I was, while they were singing, I, I felt like asking each one of you two questions. What's the name of your mother? And what's the name of your father? Just two questions. And let you tell me the name of your mother and of your father. So those are the nearest kin to you. Your father provided your sperm. Your mother incubated you. Did you ever think that if you committed a crime, your mother may not ever get into a house to live? Because the government can't provide enough money to buy a house for your mama or low-cost housing because they've got to spend to upkeep the prison. See, prison is a big house that keeps you. But that could also keep your mother out of a house. If the government can spend money on criminal activities and therefore cannot provide low-cost housing for your mother. So you got a house, but your mommy ain't got a house. She's been living with her cousin. In other words, the activities of men can actually lead to this one. Jails and prison systems being expanded. which also, therefore, means that we have a national security issue. Men have to understand that every time I do something, even if it's slapping a woman, that's a threat to the national security. Committing adultery could create poverty in the Bahamas. You commit adultery and your wife gets angry and she files a divorce and you got four kids and the judge gives her the security for the kids, then you got three, four kids with one mother and no father and she got to pay for all of them and we got problems in society. Sex may be personal but it's never private. Can I suggest to you that the impact also can be on tourism? Look at the stats. The murder rate in our country, 99% perpetrated by males, if the United States government decides that the Bahamas is no longer a safe place to go because the murder rate is too intolerable, then they can shut down the tourism, tourism industry. You ain't, you ain't seen crisis yet. And it could be caused by just the activity of 92% men. We've got to raise the bar, brothers. Your action is not a private issue. And I'm saying to all those in prison watching me today, I'm talking to the ones who didn't come to the meeting. There are friends in your cell who are making plans to hurt people. And I'm saying, look, brother, your mother is going to be hurt by that. Your sister will be hurt by that activity. Getting back at a brother destroys your mother. Crime does pay. Crime does pay. Your mother has to pay for it. No one gets away in life. Can I put it this way? When we see these kind of problems, then we've got to have drug rehabilitation and medical facilities. So we've got to spend money now on drug rehab, when in fact you should be developing a new road or paving your road. We can't pave your road if we've got to take care of some rehabilitation problems because of drug dealers killing our kids with drugs. I beg every drug dealer to think about it. It's not the money, brother. It's the impact on your sister and your cousin. May God have mercy on us. 
Fatherless children, another result in our country. And then, of course, the last one is poverty. Poverty is a product of negligence. Poverty is not an absence of money. It's an absence of ideas. We need people who can have creative ideas that can really become productive in society and add to the welfare of our community. The males in our society could be a part of perpetrating poverty because of what we are involved in. Now, friends, when we see abused children, that's the ultimate. And recently in our country, we've been talking a lot about abused children because our kids are the ones who suffer the most in all of this. You know, I heard my friend Star, boy Star, you sure sang this morning. That was a great, great, great singing. And Star mentioned casually his children, his grandchildren. The man is in prison. He has children and he has grandchildren. Your life is not just your life. So whenever you're about to sin, think about your grandchildren, the unborn ones, and say, I'm going to do this for y'all. Become responsible beyond your own personal gratification. Take, take life more seriously than your own satisfaction. My, my, my prayer is that we as men will stop thinking in terms of ourselves and think in terms of the nation. Let me give you a few thoughts about the power of a man. Please write this down. So go the male, so go the family. So go the male, so go the community. So go the male, so go the nation. So go the male, so go the entire world. So go the male, so go the female. Why are there lesbians? You know why they're lesbians? They can't find a good man. Or they found a man who was in good. <laughs> You've been through five men and they all beat you. You think, let me try a woman. In other words, we, we, you don't understand that many times the male doesn't appreciate the power he has. God says he created the woman to be a helper to the man. But the average woman can't find a man who is doing anything to help him with. It's frustrating. So go the male, so go the children. Think that's obvious? So go the male, so go the marriages. Real men, give it to us, God. Bring us back to our sanity. James Brown used to sing a song that became the anthem of the black man in America. This is a man's world! All those who laugh, I know how old you are. <laughs> and James Brown's song became a number one hit for more than six months. Because the men loved it. This is a man's swirl, he sang. And look what the man has done with it. I hope he's, I hope he's still singing it. I hope you're still singing it now. Unemployment, drugs, broken homes, divorces, corruption, political disintegration, crisis. It's a man's world. Let's pray for a female prime minister. Let's give one of them a try. Boy, you're all clapping low. You should clap loud, lady. Let's try a good woman somewhere. <laughs> you 
You know, women are amazing. A single mother with five kids can feed them and send them to college and we still don't know how. And a man has two kids, plenty of money, and he's still complaining, I'm good enough. We must raise the bar. How do you raise the bar? Let's talk about the bar for you. And I'm talking about the place to go get liquor. You know, when you tell a man bar, he's thinking right now, standard. You don't drink standard no more, right? Well, it started as a dangerous liquor. When I was in, in, in South Street, in Bay Town, you could tell a man who had standard. You saw a fire coming down the road out of his mouth, like a dragon. <laughs> One time we were sitting on the wall, and this drunken guy walked past. And you know, standard liquor would come in those flat bottles. Anyone know what them flat bottles? Come on, from experience. Standard liquor, alcohol, comes in a flat bottle. That's the original liquor. What you want to today ain't no liquor. There ain't no real liquor today. Standard is the standard. Real liquor. And this guy took this standard bottle, and this is like 10 o'clock in the morning. And he, we saw him coming down the road, 10 o'clock in the morning. He's staggering, drinking this thing. And he put it in the back pocket, and they keep it close, you know. They call that their baby. Got a pocket. And he told me walking down, and he was so drunk, he fell down, brown. And all of a sudden, we looked at this guy, and we saw all the standard all over the road. And he was laying there saying, oh, 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 Lord. And we looked at him, and he says, oh, Jesus. He, and he felt it wet stuff all around his, his leg. And he's thinking, oh, God, oh, please, let it be my blood. The world is in a global crisis. Natural forces are threatening human welfare. Fear is exploding. But there is hope. The kingdom of God is never in crisis. It's time to overcome personal and global crisis and learn the secrets to thriving in challenging times by purchasing a copy of Dr. Miles Monroe's book, Overcoming Crisis. Learn how to overcome the seasons of crisis. Rise Above Crisis, Strategies to Managing Crisis, The Kingdom Deployment, The Seed Principle, The Management Mandate, Maximize the Benefits of Crisis, and Discover Your Work Beyond Your Job. To purchase a copy of this book, call 1-242-461-6400 or visit us on the World Wide Web at bfmmm.com. You do not have to live in crisis. You can overcome it. Get your copy of Overcoming Crisis today. Today. The word bar means the standard, not the liquor, but the measure. The word bar also means the measure by which you handle comparison. You compare yourself to a bar. The male was designed by God to be the standard for the family, the measure for the human rights. Matter of fact, the mayor was created to set the, pre the precedence, rather, for the human family. That's why God made him first. The male is important in setting the bar. The male was created to establish the environment and the atmosphere for the entire society and the community. This is why when the males are out of whack, the country is dysfunctional. A woman actually measures her womanhood by a man in her life. This is why it's difficult for many females to find their true womanhood. Because they can't find the bar to measure it against. The male is God's standard for society. Now, I know this may not make sense, but let me show you how this works. Let me take you a little further. Please get a copy of the CD if I'm moving too fast. But here's a list. Write this down, please. The bar is the original 
established mark of anything. Everything in life has a bar. For example, the bar for, for seeds is they must be planted in soil. That's the bar. Plants need soil. That's a bar. So if you take a plant out of the soil, you violated the standard and the plant dies. The standard for fish is water. That's the bar. If you change the bar, you can destroy the product. If you take the fish out of water, the fish dies. Because the water is the standard for the fish. So, if you want to keep things in order, you must know what is the standard. That's why the second word is important. The bar is the principle. It is the foundation. The bar is the original standard of anything. The bar, the principle, the foundation, is always established by the manufacturer of a product. No customer sets the bar. When you buy a product, you don't decide how it functions. The bar comes already inherited in the product. It's inherent. So when you buy a car, for example, you don't decide what to put in that car. The manufacturer decides what puts, what puts in the car. And so the car functions based on the bar set by the manufacturer. And that's why this is so important. The bar defines the product. The bar is the key to safety and function. When you lower the bar or change the standard, the entire product malfunctions. Because it, con it reconfigures the whole thing. If you like apple juice and you put apple juice in your car, in a gas tank, even though you like apple juice, the car will malfunction. Because the bar for running a car is gasoline, not apple juice. So the manufacturer set that standard. Now, remember, you can decide what you want to put in the car. Your personal opinion doesn't change the bar. So we cannot decide what's the standard for life. God is the manufacturer of humanity. He created the product called man. And only God knows how to set that standard. He already set it. And if you violate the standard, what happens? You malfunction. And so the principle of bar is this. Number one, the bar is never set by the athlete. You know, those of you who... who, who uh, who are involved in, in high jumping or pole vaulting, there's a bar that they set. And the bar is set by, not by the athlete, it is set by the, the officials in the game. When you want to go and win a, any contest, you don't set the bar. The bar is set by the officials. And so that's important to remember because the standard is never set by you or me. The principle is built into the product. God says to the male, this is what you, you were born to do. If you, if you don't do this, you malfunction. And so we need to find out what does it mean to be a male? What is God's criteria? What is God's true standard? Principles are never at the mercy of the creation. Creation is at the mercy of principles. I'm going to say this slowly. Principles are never at the mercy of creation. Creation is at the mercy of principles. For example, my rectum is an exit. Who made it an exit? The creator, the manufacturer. And the only thing that comes out of my rectum is garbage, refuge, poison. Now, you can pass a law in Congress. You can pass a law in the Parliament. You can pass a law in the Senate and say, from now on, this exit shall be an entrance. Nature completely ignores your law. Because creation is at the mercy of principle. I heard the news yesterday on CNN where Barack Obama so greatly disappointed me when he came out so clearly defending anti-nature. Let 
Let me say something to you. God is not in competition with you. Hear me before I close. God has no interest in your opinion. None. God don't care what any one of us says. You know, it's, God to me is just like Ford Motor Company in Detroit. They make that car. They tell you, we say, it functions on unleaded gasoline. And they ship it to you. Now, you can be anointed, appointed, disjointed. You can have a PhD in physics, psychology, zoology. You can have the most money in the world. But you have to put unleaded gasoline in that car. You can bind and loose. You can speak in tongues. You can call a committee around the car. You can vote against gasoline. But that car will only function with unleaded gasoline. The product is never subjected to the customer. You want your life to work? You don't tell God how to work your life. You didn't create yourself. You know, this is why God has what he calls command. A command is a law. A law is a principle. A principle is the bar. God says, look, thou shalt not. Now, people get excited and they say, well, he is encroaching upon my freedom. Thou shalt not. The, this is democracy. What do you mean I cannot? God says, thou shalt not. Yeah, but you see, I'm free to do what I want to. I'm a man. I'm a woman. God says, thou shalt not. Now, how come you can pick up, buy a computer or an iron, and in the iron box is a book. And the book has, thou shalt not operate near heat. Thou shalt not operate near water. How come you obey that manufacturer and won't obey that manufacturer? Why don't you take your iron and say, I disagree with General Electric. I bind them. I don't believe. I, I, I got an anointing to put iron in water while it's plugged in. I'm going to prove to them that I have a high anointing. Yes, you sure will have a high anointing. It'll be a dead anointing. Give God a praise for the Lord. It never changes. When God gives a command, listen carefully. Do you know something? When you read the manual, the manual simply says, do not operate near water. It doesn't say, because thou shalt be shocked. Go back and read. Go ahead and read. It doesn't tell you what's going to happen. You see, God doesn't explain nothing. He just says, I'm the manufacturer. This is how it operates. So God says, thou shalt not commit adultery. He doesn't explain the fact that your wife's going to leave you. Five kids going to be without a father. They're going to end up joining a gang. They're going to shoot somebody. They're going to go to jail. You're going to be embarrassed. God simply says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Laws are created to protect, not restrict. Can you say it with me? Laws are created to protect, not restrict. So when you see a law, don't trust with the law. Listen, there's a law right outside this building when you leave it. You see a stop sign. Stop. Okay. You can say you can say to yourself, I'm buying that law. Mm -mm, I got I got an intelligent brain. I could go past that anytime I want. No problem. Why do we stop at stop signs, but don't stop at thou shall not commit fornication? Oh, I better back up that. You're quiet on that. See, we stop to the red light, but we'll stop to the fence light. Let them all right. The fine flight. Like. 
in, 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 in other words, we think the laws are different, you know. Laws protect you. God says, thou shalt not steal. Ask the young man over there. They'll tell you. They wish they had, didn't, didn't you wish you had obeyed that? Yeah, sure, I know that is the law. But, but you see, we, we have this idea. I can get away. You never get away in life. You never get away in life. It comes back now, or it comes back later. You don't win with nature. Write this down, please. Genesis 2.15. Just notice. It says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. To do what? To work it. And to cultivate it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat. From every tree of the garden. Okay, that's a pretty good deal. He says, but there's only one tree you mustn't touch. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This guy got ten billion trees and only one he's supposed to touch. We are amazing, aren't we? And then God said, the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. What God was given Adam was a law. He was given him a bar. He said, now don't violate the bar. Stay with the principle. When you violate principles, principles never lose. You lose. You get the best quality grade A orange juice from Florida Orange Juice Company, and you pay $20 a box and put it in your car because it's quality orange juice. The car doesn't care how much you pay. It malfunctions. Because you violated the principle. Who lose when you violate the principle? You lose because the car stops functioning. Now, one thing I learned about cars and, and orange juice. Paul McKenna can help me here. If your car was running on gasoline for months, years, and one day you decide, I'm going to try the anointed orange juice. And you put it, you put it in the car. Beautiful orange juice in the tank. Do you know, this is, this is, I've seen this happen. Do you know that if you start the car, it will start. Am I right? Come on, you can't start from it. It will start. And if you sit in it and change the gear, it will work. And if you press the accelerator, the car will move. And it may even take you three or four miles down the road. But somewhere, somewhere along the line, somewhere, you have a little tricking experience. <laughs> and you think it's the devil. And then after a few minutes, it'll run a little bit. And it'll stop again. And it'll jerk again. <laughs> now you see, that's how sin is. When you sin first, you think you got away. Ain't nobody know. Ain't nobody saw. The phone was in tap, you thought. There was no camera, you thought. And so you go on, and you, and, and, and guess what? And you do it again. And you got away, you do it again. You got away, and you do it again. But you don't know that you're about to hit the four mile mark. Because you got away the first time, doesn't mean you're free. And when that hits, now let me tell you something about, about orange juice <laughs> and cars. While you're driving past the first three miles, it's working. It's using up the fuel that was in the system. So you're hailing everybody. Hi, y'all. How are you doing there, Joe? And they think you're fine. And everybody thinks you are fine. So they say, hey, how are you doing, brother? And then, in the middle of my little Butler Highway, at high traffic time, everybody present, even your sister and your cousin and your wife driving past, the bishop, the, the friend, 
and you stop chicka 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 See, let me tell you how life is. When you get caught, everybody sees. No one sees when you go to get gasoline. That means no one sees when you make the right decisions. It's a private thing. But you'll never stop on the highway in public if you make private decisions correctly. I beg you with all my heart, let us go into 2010 as a community of people who don't substitute fuel. What was wrong 4,000 years ago is still wrong. That's the Old Testament. Oh? Okay, so stealing is Old Testament law. Come to my yard. I will shoot you and then tell God he died. Don't know how it happened. In other words, we got this idea that well, that's an old law from my grandmother. Your granny was on to something. Gasoline works. A car can never outgrow fuel. And you know, I'm 20 years old now. I don't need fuel no more. Oh, really? You cannot decide what the bow will be. This is why the Bible says, if any man wants to make himself successful, he must obey the Word of God. The Word of God is that manual in the box of humanity that comes with the human. And God says, if you operate according to my instructions, you will run eternally. If you violate these instructions, I have no warranty, no guarantee about your life. I love what manufacturers do. They always tell you, go back and pick up your manuals, the ones you never read. You see in them. <laughs> it always says, the back page always says, warranty. And then the other page says, guarantee. Now, guarantee is the commitment of the manufacturer. Warranty is the promise. He said, look, if you want the guarantee to remain, you must keep the warranty intact. The warranty always says things like this. Do not attempt to fix this product yourself. That means the TV ain't working. Don't go get your screwdriver. It says, do not submit this product to an unauthorized dealer. Interesting statement. Then it says, do not attempt to change the part. Then a little fine print. If you violate the above instructions, this warranty is cancelled. That means don't call us. If you need advice about your life, you better go ask God. Stop talking to unauthorized dealers. Yeah? Am I right, God? See? Here you are having problems in your marriage, and you're going to get advice from a divorcee. Now, when I say divorcee, a lot of divorcees are healed, okay? But there are those who are still in the, in the fray. Like, in, in other words, their marriage ain't working, and you go to them for help. Boy, my marriage ain't working. Mine ain't too either, child. Them old dogs, child. And they, and they, and they give you their advice. Authorized dealers are those sanctioned by the manufacturer, trained by the manufacturer, who were sent to represent the manufacturer with manufacturer genuine parts. Jesus Christ is the only authorized dealer sent from the factory of heaven to fix the product called man. 
Now, Buddha is a service man. Muhammad is a wonderful service man. Hare Krishna, that's a service man. But if you want an authorized dealer, Christ says no man comes to the factory except through me. He said, many shall come and say, I am Christ. And may even deceive some of you who think you're smart, he said. He said, but if the Son sets you free, he's the authorized dealer, then you are free indeed. I got a feeling that God's about to set some people free in this place today. Can I hear an amen? And so I want to thank all of you for making a commitment today that 2010, you're going into that year committed to never using orange juice in your gas tank. Anyone commit to that right now? God's taking a photograph. God should have quit God. Watch those ones. We ain't got it up here. Okay. Yeah. Just committed right now. Say, Lord, I will not break your laws. Now listen to me. What I'm going to close with is an interesting concept I want you to write down. Four words. Five words, actually. These are the words of the bar for man. All the men and women need to learn the standard. The first standard God gave the male was Eden. He put the man in a place called Eden. Eden is not really a place it's an environment. The word Eden means delightful presence. It says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, And God took the man that he had made and put him in the garden of his presence. So the first thing a male needs to be a real man is the presence of God. Now, this is important. What is Eden? I can't hear you. I want you to say it. The presence of God. Okay. So that means God has concluded that the standard is a man needs his presence before he needs the presence of a woman. He also concluding that a woman should meet a man in God's presence. Now some women will leave God's presence to go find a man. And then when she finds him, she tries to drag him back. Come, son, let's go. You got to get... You gotta. But I learned a lesson years ago. If the person doesn't change to get you, they won't change to keep you. So the best place for a female is in the presence of God. Because if you run into a man while you're there, he must be there too. But if you got to leave the presence to go look for someone, you are already putting orange juice in your tank. Now, you may say, I'll find one pastor, even though you all ain't coming on a fine one. No problem. I get married next month. No problem. But I ain't in your church. So you all, you all, you all, you know, he ain't saying, you my Okay, no problem. And two miles down the road in marriage, chip, 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 chip. Phone call. Pass the phone. He asked us in the gas station. <laughs> what do you want? You want? <laughs> hey, what's the present? A real man loves God's presence. That's why I'm proud of you guys, man. Keep worshiping. Keep singing to the Lord. Because that's where a man comes alive. Number two. God gave the man work. That's number two. Presence before a woman, work before a woman. The word work means to become. Discover your vision, your plan, your purpose to become. Because the woman ain't here yet. And when she comes, she comes to help you become what you already discovered. Third thing God gave the man was cultivation. He says, you care for this place. Now, cultivate is an amazing word. A real man cultivates. To cultivate means to bring the best out of something. 
To cultivate means you fertilize something, you water it, you culture it, until it becomes its best. All of the fruit comes out. It becomes full-blown. That's cultivation. A good man, a real man, always cultivates people. So when a man, a real man meets a woman, he improves her. I have heard this many times. I was doing so good until I married him. Now what they're saying is, I was on my way to bearing fruit. And I got married to rock. <laughs> and, 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 and everything shut down. You didn't marry a real man. By the way, I always tell men this. This is why God will never give you a finished woman. Can I repeat that again? God will never give a man a finished woman. Because the role of the man is cultivation. So the woman you're looking for does not exist, brothers. God will only give you raw material. <laughs> Every woman you meet will have a defect. Something. And your job is to do what Jesus does with his woman. The Bible says, husband, love your wife like Christ loves his wife. And it tells us how. First of all, he is laying his life down for her sake. And then it says, he washes her. And then he removes every spot, every wrinkle, every blemish, until she is sparkling like a bride. He says, and then he presents her to him. And he says, that's mine. That's what I did. See that? That's mine there. I said that. That's a real man. Shout it man loud anyhow. All the single ladies. All the single ladies. Lift your hands and wave. Come on. Wave up. Come on. All the single ladies. All the single ladies. Hey, put your hand down, brother. <laughs> Woo. Whoa. Why glad the cap wasn't on you just now. The cap will save your life. <laughs> single lady, hold your hand up. Come on. I'm going to give you a pastoral blessing right now. If you're single, hold your hand up. I'm going to give you a prophetic blessing. Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank you for joining us today on Living Effectively. For copies of this program, the complete teaching series, books, CDs, DVDs, magazines, and other resource materials by Dr. Miles Monroe for information on seminars, conferences, workshops, and itinerary travels to your area. Visit our website at milesmonroeinternational.com or bfmmm.com. Email us at info at nmi.com. And remember, our mission is to help you live effectively.